field, the definition of shareholder has become larger than simply the people who are measuring the dollars and cents in a conventional way. Uh, founder of Patagonia wrote the forward to the book. Well, his company remains a for-profit business. That profit is going in perpetuity to solving problems and issues that he cares about, or he thinks uh, shareholders are people who have a stake in the environment being sustainable for generations to come. Hi there, I'm Ben Morton, and you're listening to the Ben Morton Leadership Podcast. It's the weekly show that brings you inspiring interviews with senior leaders and genuine subject matter experts. And it's all designed to help you be the very best leader that you can possibly be. It's my gift to you and it's totally free. This week, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mark Miller, who is the co-author of Legacy in the Making, building a long-term brand to stand out in a short-term world. Mark is the founder of the Legacy Lab, which is a thought leadership and consulting practice that explores how brands can build modern legacies. He's also the Chief Strategy Officer at Team One, Publicist Group's global luxury and premium brand agency. Recently, Mark and his strategy team at the Legacy Lab published a pioneering study. It reports on the rare breed of leaders and brands writing history every day, the people they inspire to bring the past forward, and the physical or digital products and experiences they create to build lasting legacies in a short-term world. Traditionally speaking, legacy refers to the past. This important study from Mark and his team examines legacy as a still vital part of today. The resulting book, Legacy in the Making, has been endorsed by Simon Sinek as a must-read for anyone who wants their work to last beyond their lifetime. It was a number one new release on Amazon and a bestseller on the Washington Post list and many other places. Now, I get sent many books as a result of hosting this show and hand on heart, this is one of the best that I've seen in a long time. As a result, this is an incredibly rich podcast interview where Mark shares some incredible stories of truly great leadership at remarkable businesses. There will be some you have heard of for sure and others that you probably haven't heard of. Mark has also kindly given us two copies of the book to give away to listeners of the show for free. All you need to do if you want to try and win one of those copies is to click on the link in the show notes or any of my social media posts linked to this episode and then just add your email address. We'll then take care of the rest for you and enter you into the draw. So now, and without any further delay, let me introduce you to Mark Miller. Mark, a very warm welcome to the podcast. Uh, it's great to have you with us uh, as we're recording this just in the new year. Let me say Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you as well, Ben, and thank you for having me on your program. No, it's, it's my pleasure. And I was just saying before we hit record, really been looking forward to this one. Uh, it's been quite nice, the first one for me recording into the new year. So I've had the, the, the great pleasure of sitting, flicking through your, your book over the past 10 days whilst I've been taking some, some holiday. And um, well, we're going to talk more about the book in a second, but um, I, I read a lot for my job and for pleasure. Doing this podcast, I get sent a lot of um, author's books to look at. And hand on heart, this is one of the ones I've, I've enjoyed the most in a, in a long time. It just strikes me as being sort of thoroughly researched really well written and and beautifully presented it's a lovely book to have in your hands and on your coffee table so uh it's a great great job and thank you for sending a copy over or copies because actually we've got you've kind of given us a couple of copies to give away to listeners which we will talk about later on oh that's very meaningful to have your uh your reflections on the book as well so thank you for that also cool well look let's let's dive in um seeing as i've been talking about how great it is can you give us a a brief brief synopsis, sorry, of Legacy in the Making. What's the context and premise of the book? One of the ways I like to describe it is thinking about convention versus unconvention. And for that reason, we start with the notion of convention. Uh, Conventionally, the type of leader uh, you were could be easily understood 
by a rather simple choice. Either you were the type of person that chose to prioritize monetary success, aiming to earn your millions and today your billions of dollars, or you were the type who chose to make a greater cultural contribution. Effectively, it was short-term profit or long-term purpose and never shall the two meet. But what I came to learn about and write about in Legacy in the Making were those leaders and brands that seemed to resolve that paradox. Uh, and so in turn, the book, I feel, shares an unconventional point of view, unconventional lessons from leaders like the founder of Patagonia, the co-founders of Taylor Guitars, even the re-founders of the championships Wimbledon, who not only succeed in the short term, but also over the long term by combining the ideas of commerce and contribution in their work. Not commerce or contribution, but about the coming together of the two. What was the catalyst, Mark, for you setting off on this project to, to write the book? Or sort of why, why did you decide to, to write it? My full time occupation is uh, serving as the chief strategy officer at a global ad agency. Uh, with the headquarters in Los Angeles, where we collaborate with some iconic and premium brands. Um, And there was a point in time in the recent past where two of those brands, one in the hospitality space and one in the automotive industry, were coming up on important and or milestone anniversaries. Specifically, the hospitality brand was turning 30 and felt its age might be a negative since in their category it was perceptually better to be younger, not older. Right. Meanwhile, the automotive brand was turning 25, and they actually saw it from the other point of view. They thought it was a disadvantage to be so young in a category where being older seemed to matter more. And yet here we were with two very successful brands, nearly the same age, that had these very deep questions about ongoing relevance. And so that inspired me to explore other topics. Specifically, I was curious to learn about how, if at all, a brand's history mattered when it came to the subject of determining present and future success. In part, what I came to learn was that a brand's enduring success was often rooted in its beginnings, especially when those beginnings were about making a positive long-term change to culture, society, and or a category. Um, In short, brands that only ever started with the idea that they were going to make a lot of money did not seem to adapt to change over time very well. Meanwhile, brands that were much clearer about their reason for being on top of making money, seem to make better, faster changes to maintain their relevance over time. And I think that's why brands like the New Yorker magazine, for example, that we talk about is a lovely example of a publishing brand that has endured going on nearly 100 years, whereas many of their near like competitors haven't had the same sort of wonderful uh, present or future. In fact, many of them have disappeared and are in the process of disappearing. Just pausing to try and articulate and, and word this this question as clearly as I can. So if you think about all of the sort of brands that you looked at and researched for, for the book, and I guess other businesses and brands that, that you know of, what's the sort of split in terms of age of businesses, in terms of those that are combining purpose with, with profit? Is, are there a lot of very old established brands doing that or is it more common in much younger startups or or do you get a sense of it's it's fairly fairly even because it certainly appears to me that kind of this question or conversational topic around um, purpose and profit seems to be quite a new new conversation but what's what has your journey in writing this book kind of showed you one of the really important beginning places for the research was to consider brands that were older, established, been around 100 years and longer, as well as to look at new and emerging brands that have been around for 10 years and less and everything in between. Part of what we were looking to explore was effectively the question that you just posed to me, which is, is there a bias here that older companies have um, a tendency to favor ideals that are about permanence? And younger companies born in a modern digital age, for example, yeah. are more, um, they're happy to be ephemeral. Um, they're not looking for the sort of long-term success. And one of the things that we learned, and certainly one of the things we write about is, it's an idea that doesn't discriminate based on length of existence. Um, there are plenty of band brands that are 10 years and younger that have a perspective that is focused on contribution and commerce. As well, there are plenty of brands that are 100 years and older that have the same point of view and everything in between. It seems to come down to a style of leadership 
um, and a personal s- set of values mm. more than it begins with what type of company, what industry, how long have we been around? And so uh, we really cover it from start to end, um, younger brands and older brands, to give many leaders a sense that they could find their place in a narrative like this one. It, it, it was, as you said to me, one of the first questions that we considered. When you say legacy, I think people yeah. immediately think we're talking about legacy brands and therefore we must be talking about older brands. And in fact, the point of view of the book is counter to that. It's a forward-looking perspective on legacy, and it's for any leader or brand that takes the point of view that legacy is something that is written every day, all the time, in perpetuity, versus something that's only reflected upon in the past. Yeah. And going on, on that note, actually, it was the chapter I, or the case study, I just finished reading after I'd popped you over some some draft questions, which was Ritz Carlton Hotel, which really resonated with me. I've stayed in a few Ritz Carltons. I've heard and told the story many times, linking it to leadership about the little boy who left his giraffe behind in the hotel, not only posted it back, but sent the photo album and the ID card, all, all of that, that good stuff. But reading about the reading about Ritz Carlton that struck me as from the ones I've read so far as probably the the business that pays the the most attention to creating that legacy every single day and really sort of encouraging enlisting all those people that, that work for them in, in doing so, right? As opposed to, as you say, legacy being something that's fixed in the past. There are a number of principles we reflect upon and write about in the book. There are five in total. The Ritz Carlton story appears in the chapter that talks about uh, a principle that we call behavior beliefs. And fundamentally what we observe um, is we see so many brands that make lofty promises, grandiose promises, and at the best of times, sometimes they deliver on them. And the hardest and worst of times, they often don't because they sort of say, well, values are good for when times allow for it, but values don't guide what we do when there are financial realities and constraints that get in the way. And the Ritz Carlton, I think, is just a lovely example of a brand that says we think about what matters to us most, and then we demonstrate that this truly matters to us by virtue of our behaviors each and every day. And when you think about how, you know, one of the most common questions is how do you scale culture? How do you scale values? Um, in part, it's the way they hire it. In part, it's the way they train it. But more than anything, it's the way they embrace it and, and live it. So the story that you tell about the little boy and his giraffe is a lovely one, which is family goes on vacation. Anyone who's a parent uh, who has a young child understands that when they leave a favorite yeah. animal behind, um, things don't go so well. Kids, kids <laughs> get upset. Parents get frantic. And so this is what happened. A child left a favorite animal behind. In this case, it was a a pet giraffe, a stuffed giraffe. And rather than just getting it and sending it back immediately, because that's what the family requested, it was within the culture and the spirit of the Ritz-Carlton to create an experience and a memory that would live on with that child and that family for a lifetime. So they took the giraffe. Uh, They gave it a vacation at the hotel. They documented it with photographs. They put together a journal and they sent the child back not only their stuffed or pet giraffe, but also a photo album and a book documenting what the giraffe was doing while they were apart. Then effectively, the giraffe wasn't having a bad time. The giraffe was having a great time. And there was no manual that said, what do you do when the giraffe gets left here? But there was a culture that inspired people to act and behave that way. And I think that's just, um, it's a beautiful example. Yeah. And the bit I took from reading that section of the book as well, there's a culture at Ritz Carlton, it seems, that not only allows, but encourages people to interpret what the values mean so they can just get on and act and and do stuff. Because you can imagine in in another organization, another hotel chain, where if someone was, an employee was out taking pictures of a, a pet giraffe by the swimming pool and then tried to get signed off some money for getting a photo album kind of paid for some would say like what what on earth are you doing who approved that don't, don't be ridiculous right but it's just in, in, encouraged and the conditions are set to allow that to happen so that's a, a lovely way to characterize it i think that's exactly right they create the conditions they share their values in a way where people understand them in fact they have a lovely uh, ritual 
And the ritual is something called line up. Um, and this is something that we remark upon in the book as well, which is at every location around the world every day, the ladies and gentlemen, the Ritz Carlton get together and talk about a value that is central to the organization. They talk about what it means to them and they'll share an example of something that happened recently that demonstrates this isn't just a value out of the history books. It's a living value uh, that manifests each and every day. And so if you can imagine every lady and gentleman at every property, including the head office, talking about the values in real time and the behaviors they create, they're effectively inspiring one another to carry the traditions on, carry them forward, adapt and evolve for the world that we live in. And it's, um, it's enviable. Mark, the other bit that really resonated with me that I was keen to explore with you in, in our chat now, which I think it was in the first chapter of the book, you was talking about two nearsighted traps that leaders can fall into that are, I think you said, both linked to the to the past. Can you tell us about those two traps and sort of how prevalent you think they are? Because that really, when I read that section, it really resonated with me. Sure. For, for context, um, the title of the book is Legacy in the Making. The subtitle is about long-term thinking in a short-term world. And effectively, it says there are those who are thinking yet again about profit and purpose because they're trying to achieve something over the long term versus those who are only measuring success in a week, a month, a quarter, or a year. And so these two traps that we talk about tend to be traps that personify or typify short-term thinkers, and we refer to them as blind spots. Um, And they kind of go like this. Uh, Short-term thinkers uh, will do these things. They will either hold tight to the past, never wanting to deviate from the same choices and decisions that launched their brand or business into the world in the first place, or the exact opposite. They cut all ties to the past and chase only the future. And the reasons for making these choices, I feel, are fairly intuitive. Um, You repeat what worked because it seems less risky. After all, who can fault a leader for doing what once worked so well? Or do you change everything because you'll never get famous telling the same old story? Upon reflection and additional interviewing, you know, we often hear people talk about the distinction between managers and leaders. Well, managers who are managing brands, companies, and organizations principally think about not just managing those groups, but managing and building their resumes. They're planning for for the next job, and that's why they tend to lead with that logic. Manage risk because that looks good on a resume, or change something and get my 15 minutes of fame because that also looks good on a resume. But leaders who are building not just legacy brands, that's not so much what we talk about, but building brand legacies, writing them every day, keeping them vital, they're working on something bigger than writing job resumes. And so I think that's the distinction. If you're the kind of leader that's working on building a brand legacy, something that will live on in perpetuity, you'll avoid the short-term trap. And if you're someone that's thinking about your next job, your next opportunity living in the moment, you minimize risk or you go for your 15 minutes of fame and you get a line item on your resume. Yeah. And I guess this next question links to a previous one. It's almost a sister question, I guess. What impact does whether or not the company is sort of publicly listed or privately owned with just one or two investors make right because it strikes me that if you're a publicly listed company the shareholders want their annual return and want to see see the growth so is it is it harder to make long-term kind of choices and create a legacy brand build brand legacy kind of for big publicly listed companies seems intuitive that maybe it, it is I feel like the answer is yes and no, and it's a great question, and it's one um, that's come up repetitiously over time. Uh, the reason the answer intuitively is it must be more complicated is because when it's a privately held business, you're accountable to yourself. And mm. so you're willing to take more risk. You're willing to lean into passion and values because the stakeholder you need to appeal to is, is you. Um, And so for that reason, yes. However, the book does cover off a combination of uh, public companies as well as private companies. And I would say this notion, I really like the way you talked about it, which is it comes down to shareholder. And so many years ago, I went to business school. And one of the first things we were taught was taught rather was the responsibility of an organization was to maximize shareholder revenue. But they meant in conventional financial terms. Mm -hmm. These days, 
field, the definition of shareholder has become larger than simply the people who are measuring the dollars and cents in a conventional way. Um, Patagonia, Yvonne Trenard, uh, founder of Patagonia, wrote the foreword to the book. Um, mm-hmm. He's been in the press recently because, well, his company remains a for-profit business. That profit is going in perpetuity to solving problems and issues that he cares about. And so he sees the shareholders as greater than just a quote-unquote conventional shareholder. He thinks uh, shareholders are people who have a stake in the environment being sustainable for generations to come. And so if you can embrace the spirit of always think about the shareholder, but welcome in this evolving definition that the shareholder means something more than it did many years ago, then I think in that way, making choices and decisions maybe aren't as hard as you think they might be. Hey, quick one for you. I want to make sure that you know about my 10 for 10 leadership program. It's an online program that's totally free. It's bite-sized and it covers some of the most common leadership topics and challenges that I frequently get asked about. It's also a course that gets consistently great feedback. You can find out more by heading to the online courses page of my website at ben-morton.com. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I guess probably from Yvonne Chouinard's perspective, kind of shareholders is every human being and creature that kind of li- lives on the planet, right? Because from what I understand, that's that's one of his true sort of driving forces, right? Yes. And one of my favorite recollections from our interview years ago was uh, Lucas Conley, my co-author, and I uh, had asked Yvonne, out of all the many things he's created at uh, Patagonia, what is or was the one thing that he is proudest of? And our expectation is he was going to talk about uh, an article of clothing, something that was very close to the business that he created. And he paused, and at the time what he said is they have an education facility on campus by the headquarters. And any employee uh, within proximity can send their kids to that school to get an early childhood education for caring for the environment. And he said, it's really important because caring for the world we live in isn't something that you should just fall into later in life when it's too late. You should grow up believing that's important and that will shape how you move through the world. And he paused and said something like, you know, the CFO would tell you it's the greatest cost on the books every year. But actually, I'm here to tell you it's the greatest investment we make every year because we're making an investment in the values we care most about. And I think those are the kinds of things that public companies can do as well. Yvonne has the authority to tell his CFO, we're going to do it because it matters to me. But it actually has benefit for employees, for customers, and there's a business application to it. There's no reason publicly held companies couldn't take that same point of view to understand, as we just discussed, your shareholders are more than just the quote unquote conventional shareholder. Yeah, fascinating. The other bit I was really keen to to ask you about as well is there was a bit, I think again, it's in the first chapter where the research was suggesting that some of these mod, modern legacy brands are, and I put this in inverted commas, led by individuals who are guided by personal am- ambitions. As I read that, it struck to me that surely there's there's probably a fine line there, right, between sort of <laughs> being driven by genuine personal ambition that comes from a very good place and sort of another the other side of that line where sort of the, the negative side or representation of ego sort of r- runs amok slightly and we tend into slightly sort of narcissistic traits traits perhaps like what's what what's your thoughts on that what did you learn through the process of of the interviews you conducted for for creating the book i have to put a parenthetical uh, thought around the statement which is um that statement is true when the ambition of the leader in charge is to make positive long-term change to culture and society so i think it's exactly right which is passion and ego unchecked in the direction of trying to do negative things to society and that are short-term oriented um, have consequences uh, that are not so great, not just for the moment, but for generations to come. Whereas the leaders that we tend to celebrate in the stories we tend to write about 
are inspired by the ones who are trying to make positive long-term change to culture and society. I'll give a lovely example. There's a brand that we talk about called Taylor Guitars. Taylor Guitars is a brand that's coming up on being 50 years old, a similar in age to Patagonia. The co-founders always ask themselves the following question when they make choices and decisions. They ask themselves, in 10 years' time, will we be happy that we made this choice? And if the answer is yes, they're prepared to do hard things today to get to a better outcome 10 years from now. It's not always the most popular choice, at least at the moment. And it's certainly not always the easiest choice. There are business consequences and emotional realities. But the outcome is you have um, not quite an upstart, but a newer brand like Taylor Guitars that not only rivals, but is leading brands like Martin Guitars that have that are exceptional, that have been around for a long time, but have been recently surpassed by brands like Taylor. And the way they do it is they always remind themselves that even though they are a more youthful company, you know, not quite, not 100 years old, they want to have the kind of impact that means they will be in business in 100 years and so on. They did something really interesting, too. They recently made it an employee-owned company. And that came from how the co-founders looked at succession planning. So what they could have done, for example, is they could have cashed out in the moment, taken their very successful brand, sold it to the highest bidder, and lived very nice lives for themselves. And who knows what would have happened to Taylor Guitars. But what they observed from like competitors is the highest bidder would come along. They would keep the famous brand name. They would take costs out of the manufacturing process and effectively try to produce the same thing repetitively at a lower cost, not improving the brand experience, but making it inferior. Hmm. And while they could have cashed out and made more money for the moment, it was more important to them to have a vital Taylor Guitars that would live on forever. And they couldn't think of a better, not just caretaker, but co-owner, co-author, co-leader of the brand's future than their employees who shared their values. Yeah. And that is not a common gesture from an organization, but it shows you the extent to which when you care deeply and you're willing to buck the trends and move according to your own philosophy, values, and beliefs, how you can not only create something exceptional in the world, but sustain it over time. Yeah. Link to that, Mark, actually. Do you mind sharing the, because it strikes me as being very, very similar, and I'd not heard of the the Bluebird Cafe in, in Nashville before, but it seems like a similar story, right? That sort of the the end slash not the end of the Bluebird Cafe is is very similar, wasn't it? I, I love the story. It's actually in the same chapter as the Ritz-Carlton story about a brand that behaves its beliefs. And for those who are less familiar with it, it's an incredibly iconic space in Nashville um, built around the premise of embracing songwriters. So, of course, we all know the famous songs that we hear on the radio, um, particularly by country uh, artists. Taylor Swift started as a country artist. Certainly Garth Brooks is a country artist. Dolly Parton, Dixie Chicks, and on and on. All older musicians, contemporary musicians, and the next generation. So the Bluebird is a small space that welcomes in songwriters, and roughly 100 people get to have that experience on a nice nightly basis where they hear the songwriters play music in the round. So the musicians sit in a circle and the hundred people more or less gather around them and the songwriters tell stories about what inspired them to write the song. You may never have heard the songwriter's name, but you'll recognize other song. Yeah, yeah. Taylor Swift effectively got her start there. Garth Brooks effectively got his career um, kicked into high gear because of his affiliation and association. And on more than one occasion, this really small musical sanctuary that's a, sort of like a religious experience for country musicians has been approached to amplify the brand. And by amplify, I mean take the logo and put it on everyone's merchandise, open up larger theaters so more than 100 people could have the experience to it, um, transport it all over the world to the bigger venues, uh, commercialize it because people see the value in it and they understand that consumers on the other end would pay a lot of money for it. So the idea of taking something that currently is in limited supply and making it more commonly available is hugely appealing to people who look at conventional dollars and cents as the measure of success. If you're a short-term thinker, of course you would do that. There's this wonderful place 
that isn't being fully merchandised and maximized in any conventional way. And yet what the founder and now the refounder has done is they protected that space. They will do the occasional new venture, but only if it lives up to the standards and values and measures of the things that they hold dear. And what they hold dear is that the songwriters mean everything to them. So think about it in these terms. The person who says, sell more shirts, open up larger venues, publish records and sell them for profit, they're starting with the stakeholders, the end consumer who have dollars in their pockets. The Bluebird starts with the point of view that they've built this sanctuary for songwriters. And every choice and decision they make is in service of creating an exceptional experience for the people who matter most because they know that when the world's best songwriters show up to perform there, audiences gather around them. And they know that when they start chasing profit and forget why they were created in the first place, all the magic goes away. And as you said, certainly there could be a temptation to say, just chase the dollars. Because when COVID happened, they couldn't keep the Bluebird open for a while. You can't gather 100 people around songwriters when there are uh, social and communal um, epidemics going on. But they found a way through, they found a way to persist, and they'll stay vital for generations because they protect and grow what they care most about. And the interesting thing for me as well that occurs to me as we're having this conversation, so we've spoken there about two, two of the examples of organizations that chose to really stay true to their beliefs and, and purpose, I guess, rather than, than cashing in. But that's not to say that you, like, cashing, in, cashing in sounds quite crude, right? But it's not to say that, that you can't, because the other interesting case study was in the book was Nix, the cosmetic brand. So grew a very purpose-based business, but did sell it and has gone on to do, create other purpose-based businesses, right? So the, 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 the two aren't mutually exclusive, are they, from what I understand? 100%. The premise of writing this wasn't to say we could segment the world into two categories. You know, as we yeah. began this conversation, it would be easy to say, here are the brands that are for profit. Here are the brands that are for purpose. Never shall the two meet. And they both have yeah. a place in the world. Yeah. It, or one is good, one is or evil. One is good and one is bad. And, and this comes at a different from a different point of view, which is on a sliding scale, some of them are more commerce driven and some of them are more uh, caring driven, some are more profit driven, some are more purpose driven, but they have both components going on. And so this isn't a book of brands that lead with their heart but don't have success. The Bluebird Cafe is very successful. Taylor Guitars is very successful. The Patagonia brand is very successful. <laughs> and they do it by leading with values. And what they would tell you is not just when times are good, but when times are bad. So Patagonia had to reduce operations as well through COVID. Taylor Guitars was in one of those categories that actually benefited because people were staying home and they took up playing instruments. And so guitars yeah. were doing wonderfully well. The Bluebird, like many in the travel and hospitality and dining space, um, had to close or reduce services for a little while. But I really love this notion that these aren't brands that lead with their values just when times are good or when the cameras are on. They're brands that lead with their values all the time, especially during the hardest times. And as you began this question, this notion of saying not one or the other, but these two things come together is exactly right. And Nick's Cosmetics is a beautiful story. Tony Co is the founder of Nick's Cosmetics. And the short version of the story goes something like this. She grew up in her parents' business. Uh, they worked in the cosmetics industry. And what she observed and learned was that often the most luxurious brands didn't necessarily have the highest quality product, but they had the most beautiful design and packaging. And often that packaging was rather over the top. And so the money was spent on creating not delicate packaging or simple packaging, uh, but but complex and ornate packaging. And so she had a perspective that she would create a high quality product at a more affordable price and package it simply and beautifully. She solved a problem that she had because she herself didn't have the kind of affluence or income to buy the kinds of high-end products that her, that her friends were getting. But she knew how to create products that were of equal or greater value and take costs out of the system. She solved a problem for herself and she grew a beautiful business. And when you ask Tony Coe 
what she thinks about profit versus purpose, one of the first things she'll tell you, as she told me, is you don't want to work for someone who doesn't want to make money. Because when you work for a leader who makes money, guess what? They can get you health benefits. They can pay you higher salaries. They can scale corporations and organizations. There's a lot of good that comes with being profitable. And you should want to work for people and alongside of people who have that point of view. And I would say the book is filled with people who represent that point of view, albeit on a sliding scale. Yeah, wonderful. Of all the case studies and companies you you looked at, which one st- stood out as being the most interesting, the most impactful for, for you and why? Because it's, uh, it's a pretty impressive list of uh, organizations and leaders that you've spoke to. So which one really stood out for you? Well, I think and hope you'll like this one like I do. It's actually not one of the feature stories. It's one of the side stories. And it's about a brand called Me and the Bees Lemonade. And so here's the story. Me and the Bees was founded in Austin, Texas, by a young woman named Michaela Almer, who was only four years old. Michaela, as it turned out, was stung by two bees in the same week. And her parents, being um, industrious and entrepreneurial at the time, said, our daughter has been scared by this. Why don't we take it as a teachable moment? And what they encouraged her to do was to learn about bees. And what Michaela learned was that bees are actually really important for our ecosystem that bees, for example, pollinate. And because of pollination, she gets to enjoy some of her favorite foods. And so now Michaela was all in on bees. They weren't scary stingers. They were wonderful creatures doing good for the world. And so she took an heirloom family recipe, a grandmother's recipe for making lemonade, and she replaced the sweetener in it with honey from bees. And her idea was proceeds from the sale would go towards saving and protecting the bees. So she built a business inspired by her personal experience, not unlike how Tony Co built a business inspired by her personal experience. So then here's what happened next. Young Michaela Almer winds up on a popular American television show called Shark Tank. Right. And an investor named Damon John makes a $60,000 investment in her business. As a consequence, she got distribution at Whole Foods Market. Her story was covered on the American news. She was even invited to the White House by the president at the time, uh, it was Obama, who named her an ambassador uh, to the environment, effectively, um, an ambassador to the pollinators. And then she was sued. She was sued by a farmer in California who said, this was all fun and games when you were a young kid in Austin, Texas, selling lemonade in your front lawn. But now your name is everywhere and my name is not. And the problem is your name sounds too much like my name. So he filed the equivalent of a trademark suit and he gave her a very short amount of time to make a change or go out of business. And so what did she do? She went back to the origin of the business. She created a brand to serve and protect the bees that was inspired by her real life experience. So she renamed her business less like a conventional brand and more like a storybook. The brand is now called Me and the Bees. And when Michaela gets up to speak, she always begins by saying, let me tell you the story of Me and the Bees. So if if there's a moral here, well, the competitor tried to take away her brand name because he felt her business was no more substantial than the name, the packaging, and the physical attributes. He could never take away her story, her beliefs, her values, which were the things that ultimately made her brand unique and different and sustainable in the world. Today, uh, for context, Michaela is in her first year of college. She is the author of a best-selling book. She continues to grow in reputation and significance. And this little story that could have been diminished and wiped out if the business was no stronger than the physical aspects lives on, I hope, in perpetuity because it stands for something far greater. It's a favorite story. Sounds like the... Um, you say farmer who tried to sue her almost rather than putting her out of business, if anything, you probably made her stronger, right? Yes. And I remember at the time, part of the conversation was, of course, the farmer has a legal argument, but in the court of public opinion, in a world of social discussion and influence, in the story of David and Goliath, she was on the right side of everything and he was on the wrong side of everything. And I think it goes to the heart of what do you value? The farmer valued short-term profit. She was eating into that. She valued 
enduring profit and enduring contribution. That was more valuable, more sturdy, more durable. Yeah, I've got to ask just because it's a fascinating and beautiful story. We have a similar show in the UK. I don't, I don't know which version came first, UK or the one across the pond. We call it Drag- Dragon's Den in the UK. Do you know roughly how old was she when she went on Shark Tank? Was she like a really young girl still? She was closer to the age of ten. She might even been. She might even been more like. Um, she, was, she was closer to the age of ten. Incredible. And so the, the business has been around for a number of years. This young lady who started the business two thousand nine. Um, has had a business that's lasted longer than many entrepreneurs who started and failed. Yeah. Yeah, I think they say, don't they, uh, certainly in the UK, if, uh, if you get beyond three years running a business, you've you've outdone most of the stats because not many make it that far. So, yeah, it's incredible. Mark, a couple of my regular quickfire questions to, to, to wrap up. What would you say is the one book that has really had – the most significant impact on you? Or maybe to ask the question another way, what's one book that you find yourself regularly recommending or gifting to other people perhaps? Or maybe it's your, maybe it's your own, <laughs> or the process of writing it. I, I certainly enjoyed writing my book and it is a topic that I'm passionate about. And like you, I'm constantly searching for inspiration. A, a favorite author is um, Jonah Berger. And a favorite book um, really stood out to me. It was a lovely surprise. It's called The Catalyst. And effectively, it's a book about the art of persuasion. And it stood out to me because I was not looking, it was recommended to me, but I was not looking forward to reading this so much. Um, I'd heard about another book that Jonah had written that was quite successful. And this one, out of the gate, I don't think had the same fanfare. And then I just fell in love with it. The storytelling, the examples that were used, and just some wonderful insights about how to communicate with people in a way that's actually effective. And so he tells a story, for example, that we often are inclined to argue someone into believing with our point of view. Yeah. And actually, one of the most persuasive ways to succeed is to arm them with the information where they can make their own choices and decisions. And so my funny aside is my nine-year-old daughter asked me about the book because it had a butterfly on it. She said, what are you reading? And I said, The Catalyst. And she said, what's it about? And I said, it's a marketing book. And she said, that sounds boring. (laughs) And I said, well, you know how you want to stay up later at night? And she said, yes. And I said, it's a book that will persuade your mother to let you do that. And she leaned in and she said, how does that happen? And I said, said, well, that's the best part. She's going to persuade herself that she should let you stay up later. And she was fascinated. Brilliant. (laughs) Love it. And Mark, what would you say, other than your smartphone, because I always have to caveat that, what's one item that if it were to be lost, stolen or broken, you'd immediately go out and replace? There, there are two, but I will lean into what I think is, uh, is slightly more important here. And it is a notebook, a physical notebook and a pen, not a particularly special pen, but an actual pen that I carry around with me. I find myself constantly asking questions and wanting to write them down, having ideas and wanting to write them down. Sometimes they're related to books. Sometimes they're related to songs. Sometimes they're not related to anything in particular, but in a world where things are fleeting and digital and sometimes can disappear with the click of a button, there's something very satisfying and important to me about the permanence of being able to put some ink on a page and know that's going to be with me for as long as I would like that to be there. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's really emerging as a bit of a theme amongst many of the senior leaders and guests I interview on this show, like carrying a notebook with them so they can physically write stuff down. And also a a love of quality stationery is emerging as a theme amongst the leaders I talk to. The notebook that I carry around with me right now uh, is from a place called Hatch Show Print. Um, They were not one of the brands that I wrote about in the book, but subsequently they were one of the brands uh, that I've read about. They're a print press. And in many ways, what they reflect upon is in a world that's moved to digital art, it's a celebration of the craft of printing, the old-fashioned craft, the old-world craft in a modern context. So the significance of having a book is meaningful to me, and this particular one matters to me because the place is a special place as well. Yeah, nice. And final question, Mark, which actually I'm really curious to, to hear your answer to this based on your journey of, of writing this book. But what do you think are three key traits for leaders today, right now in the world we find ourselves living and living and leading in? 
three traits stand out uh, to me, and I'm, I'm sure if we had a longer conversation, there would be more than Many three. More. But but but, uh, but three: uh, creativity, courage, and compassion. Uh, the creativity to see possibilities for a better today, tomorrow, and always. As we discussed partway through the conversation, when you say legacy, people think, well, that's just about holding on to the past without change. And it's not true. It's a forward-looking notion that says we should look at our past as a way to point us forward. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be open-minded enough to understand that the past has relevance, the future has importance, and what we do to make those things happen today matters a lot as well. And as a consequence, the creativity and imagination we can bring to seeing old things in new ways and new things in realistic ways, I think creativity and imagination matters tremendously. Um, courage, for me, that's the courage to do what's right, even when it's not always popular. I think Yvonne Chouinard's a lovely example of that. A little bit to our conversation earlier on, that doesn't mean just doing bold things without consideration to the negative consequences, but maybe having the courage to do good things for society and culture, um, even though sometimes they are hard things. And then finally, compassion, to put caring alongside of commerce, and that means in good times and bad. The, the Ritz-Carlton story was beautiful. They could have just sent the kid's animal back uh, to him because that would have been expedient and it would have technically solved the problem. But they were considerate enough of the child's feelings to think about how he might want to experience the giraffe coming back to him. Yeah. And I think whether it's how we interact with people, how we interact with our consumers, um, bringing some compassion to the way we do business, I think matters a whole lot these days. Mark, your answer to the final question there has drawn me back to what so far, having not read all of the books, really stands out as one of the most powerful quotes from the book that, that comes from the introduction. Um, and you say when talking about modern legacy brands, all are actively building enduring brands that are informed by the past, drawn by the future and forged continually in the present. It's just such a powerful quote for me that I think just sums up so nicely so much of the conversation we've we've had here today. Oh, thank you. That's um, it was wonderful to hear your reflections at the start of the conversation and meaningful and impactful to hear you remark upon that at the end, because that really is the encapsulation of, of what the book is all about. Thank you, Ben. Amazing. And thank you, Mark. It's been an amazing com conversation. I've been, as I say, I've really been looking forward to it. And it's a wonderful way to kick off the, the seventh season of the show. So thank you very much. I uh, wish you all the best with the book. And actually, before we wrap up, let me just ask if, if people want to know more, get in touch with you, what's the best way to, to do that? Uh, you're welcome to email me at mark, M-A-R-K dot Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R at team one, T-E-A-M-O-N-E hyphen USA dot com. And if that was a mouthful, uh, check out uh, the links that I think Ben, you and your team uh, will provide in and around this content. You're welcome to write me on social media channels, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, and so on. Amazing. Mark, one final time. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best for 2023. Thank you. You too, Ben. That's it for this episode. And let me just say a huge thank you for tuning in, listening to the show and being a supporter of what we're doing here. It really does mean a great deal. At this stage, though, let me just ask one thing of you that I'm confident will take no more than two or three minutes, five at the very maximum. Wherever you happen to be listening, please click on the subscribe button and then leave just a one sentence review of the show. It really does make all the difference and means we can grow our channels and continue to bring you better and better guests in the future that you can learn from. That's it for this episode though, folks. If you want to connect with me, talk about the show, the show sorry, leave some feedback or suggest a guest, then do please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm easy to find. I'm on there as Ben Morton Leadership. Until then, though, look after yourself. Look after those that you've got the privilege and responsibility to lead. And as always, lead on. Mm -hmm.